Okay, so today's session is going to be about uh, precardial disease, a focus on echocardiographic assessment. Okay. We start with the first case of a 32 years old lady presented with a stabbing uh, chest pain, which eases on leaning forward. And ECG upon arrival to ER is shown below. Troponin is 0.01. Uh, what is the most likely finding in echo? So, uh, given this clinical scenario and the ECG, what do you think about the ECG? It's typical of... Anterior uh, STEMI. Okay. If it is STEMI, then we need to focus more. And uh, because there is ST segment elevation and Vision. but also on the lateral uh, and the yes. inferior, yeah. And there is tagging of the PR in general. And the patient yes. is pain. Come on, Hannah, we always uh, uh, the ECG. Okay. Um, there is uh, ST elevation. Why the spirit uh, could go with uh, pericarditis? Exactly. Yes. Exactly. You are right. And 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 remember that the ECG is a piece of paper. Okay. It's just mm -hmm. one investigation. Just one test. Uh, I don't know. Yes. There is some kind of a noise there. So you should always take it all the way back into the clinical scenario. Okay. Yes. So the yes. ECG might not make a lot of sense alone as a standalone test. But mm. combined with the clinical scenario, it, may, it becomes so meaningful. So this is a 32-year-old lady with a stabbing chest pain, which eases on leaning forward. So that is pericarditis. Most likely pericarditis. Yeah. The question is, is the most likely finding an echo? It's more rim of pericardial effusion, second pericardium, pelithoric IVC, global hypokinesis, None of the above. Um, it's a, a small rim of uh, pericardial infusion, could be. Small rim of pericardial infusion. A man said it's small rim of pericardial infusion. Any other opinions? Could be none, none of the above as it's uh, <laughs> acute pericarditis, it's not chronic. Yeah, here the two the two most common uh, manifestation of pericarditis in echo is either a small rim of pericardial effusion or nothing at all, you know. But a small rim of pericardial effusion is found to be uh, around 60% of cases of pericarditis. So probably this is the most ca uh, finding of pericarditis in echo. Is more rim of precardial effusion, okay? And 40% um, or nearly 50%, you might find nothing at all, okay? Remember, in echo, you cannot appreciate the thickened inflamed precardium. So if you are looking after the inflamed precardium, by any diagnostic tool, you go for MRI, okay? MRI is the uh, diagnostic modality by which you could reveal the inflammation in the precardium, okay? But how much do we need MRI for precarditis diagnosis? Not many, not a lot, right? Because most of the time, the clinical data on one side, the ECG uh, are so enough, okay? The structure marked by the red line is found in clinical study to be associated or to associate and correlate with risk and severity of coronary artery disease, diastolic dysfunction, visceral adiposity, all of the above, none of the above. Mm -hmm. So what are we seeing here actually? What is this? What is this structure? This one. This looks to me as a bat of fat. Yes, this is fat pad, right? But there are different layers of fats of fat around the heart with different names. 
and different clinical significance as well. So this one is called what? The one immediately above the surface of the heart is what? Because Bisra. there is another one here. Visceral? Visceral uh, and parietal. Yeah, here, here it, it belongs to this in, in terms of... Uh, anatomical, yeah, in terms of anatomical, um, I mean, uh, marks, yes, this is visceral and this is pericardial, okay? But this is called what? They name it what? What kind of fat we call it? Epicardial fat. This one is epicardial fat. And the one above is pericardial fat. And we know that epicardial means on the surface of the heart. That's why the coronaries are epicardial vessels. Epicardial vessels are the coronaries. So they are directly on the surface of the heart. So the fat pad directly on the surface of the heart is the epicardial fat. And this, the next one here is the pericardial fat. You might see also mediastinal fat up here, and that's it. So the, the, you have to remember that they have different embryologic origin, different blood supply, and different clinical significance. Epicardial fat thickness is found to be associated with risk and severity of coronary artery disease, with diastolic dysfunction, and it correlates with visceral adiposity okay that's why there is a focus and um, attention is paid a lot uh, for epicardial fat so now there is a way of a standardized way to measure it and uh, the thicker it is the more of so and so and so okay especially the risk and severity of coronary artery disease okay which of the following are important technical consideration in image acquisition? Okay. Showing septal bounds requires two to three beats image acquisition. Okay. The subcostal view may give false impression of RV collapse due to respiratory fluid redistribution. The duration of RA collapse in relation to the cardiac cycle increases the sensitivity for tamponade. RV collapse is best demonstrated in 2D echo. To demonstrate the spirophasic variation, you need to coach the patient to take deep breath, deep breath in and out. A bit of a tough question, but think of it and just to speak out your thoughts. Okay, so what do we think is right here? The answer C, the duration of RA collapse in relation to cardiac cycle increases the sensitivity for tempo. Okay, type, okay. So Arich has chosen uh, C, which is the duration of RA collapse in relation to cardiac cycle increases sensitivity for tamponade. Any other opinion? Any other opinion? Uh? Okay, now for I think A, it's specificity rather than sensitivity. A specificity rather than sensitivity. Okay. Okay. So we have divergence of opinion regarding C. Our air collapse in relation to cardiac cycle. Does it increase the sensitivity or specificity of tamponade? Okay. What about A? A. The septal bounds, what is septal bounds? Septal bounds is respirophasic movement of the septum, right? Respirophasic. Now in echo always, remember, we can have respirophasic events and we can have beat to beat events, okay? So you have to know which is which because if it is respirophasic event, then you need to have a prolonged tracing, right? Because the ratio of respiratory to uh, cardiac cycle is five to one. Yeah, you have twelve respiratory rate, 
and 60 heart rate per minute. Yeah. So if you want to, if you want to capture two respiratory cycle, you have to have like 10 beats, right? You have to have 10 beats. So to demonstrate the septal bounce, you require you 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 need to require your image across 10 beats, not two to three beats. Okay. 10 beats. You have to have longer one. Or else you might miss it. So that's that's the, an important technical problem. You can easily miss septal bounds if you don't prolong the image acquisition enough. Okay. So this is important. Now I'm gonna show you which is uh, right and which is wrong here when we go when we dive in the uh, cardiac, uh, I mean uh, precardiac fusion and tamponade. But for the time being, just hold your thoughts about this. And don't worry. Now, the echo, this echo sign, we are we are showing an echo sign of the lateral and the septal E prime velocity. The lateral E prime velocity is 12, and the septal E prime velocity is 17. So this echo sign is exclusive for constricted pericarditis. Is called annulus paradoxus. It leads to overestimation of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Its validity is lost in atrial fibrillation. It shows as lateral wall decreases strain and strain rate. So, is it exclusive for constrictive pericarditis? Could be in restrictive cardiomyopathy or the, uh, any other diastolic dysfunction. Uh, uh, diastolic dysfunction, because what you are seeing here is what? You see, uh, physiologically, the lateral annular velocity is faster than the median annular velocity, right? That is annulus physiologicus, okay? The physiology is that the lateral is faster than the medial. Why? Because the, the medial is anchored to the cardiac skeleton much more than the lateral one. So the lateral one tends to be more free. That's why the velocity is faster. Now, what we have here is exactly the opposite to that physiology. We're having that the septal, which is supposed to be slower, is faster than the lateral, which is supposed to be faster. That is called annulus reverses annulus reverses because it's the reverse form of physiology okay and this indicates constrictive pericarditis but it's not exclusive of constrictive pericarditis why because simply if you have myocardial infarction that involves the lateral wall this segment is going to be hypokinetic and it's going to be slower than this one so it's not exclusive for constrictive pericarditis. Now, what does it mean? It means constriction. Yes. Why does it mean constriction? Why constrictive pericarditis leads to this? Why? Why it does lead to this? So constrictive pericarditis distorts the physiological pattern of the velocities of the lateral and septal annulus. The lateral tends to be faster than the septal physiologically, but in constriction, the septal is faster than the lateral. And simply that's because you have the precardium here, which is thick and calcified and fibrotic. So it's gonna hold this part. So this part is gonna be slowed down because of the adherent precardium above it or overlying it. That's why it's going to be slower. And once this is slower, the septal tends to go into compensatory hyperkinesis. So that's going to reverse the physiology. The septal is going to be faster than the lateral. And this is called annulus reversus. Now there is annulus paradoxus, which we are going to discuss shortly. But so far, remember this one. Annulus reverses. You get it? You get this one, huh? 
Are, are you following me? Yes. Okay, so look at the hemodynamic above. Expiration, inspiration, and expiration on the arterial blood pressure. And that's what we are seeing. So my question is, this hemodynamic sign corresponds to which echo sign? A, B, C, or D? Which one? So that demands you interpret and analyze the signal above first. So what does that mean? What are we seeing here? What are we seeing here? Do you see it well in the screen? Eh? Do you see it well in the screen? This one? Do you? I think I think it is um, like pulses paradoxus because the, the, the arterial pressure is increasing during expiration in spite of inspiration. It's not like the normal. Like yeah. uh, in the am I right or yes. So it is pulses what? Paradoxes. Exactly. This is pulses yes. paradoxes. Because during inspiration, you see the blood pressure goes down and in expiration it recovers. So a decrease in arterial pressure during inspiration compared to expiratory phase is pulses paradoxus. This is pulses paradoxus, which is a clinical sign, elicitable clinical sign, and it's a sign of tamponade. Now, what is the echo equivalence of pulses paradoxus? A, B, C, or D? Which one? Um, بس ما عندنا نخيب أنا عشان يا دافت شفت الأول وكده ما عندنا نخيب إيه. في ال في الجرافس ال I think إن not A and not C أنا طبعا أو... first of all يا أخوان I, I apologize إنه أنا I dive so deep in echo but don't worry sometimes the challenges are so helpful by the way يعني it's not necessarily that you know echo so much before you go for study of precardial disease no we can know uh wherever our level is sayeb so ma ma taqlaqu min al hajariya most most yes. probably be yeah, not, most probably it's be not okay a, it's not a because in the heart is swinging and moving uh, exactly. so it's not strictly for pericarditis or cardiac tamponade well you see it's not c also because uh, the uh, the um, ivc is uh, uh, reducible during expiration and inspiration, it's not, and this is not uh, expected in uh, constrictive pericarditis also. So I I think it's B or D. Taibia, you are, you are a novice in echo, you are not, you know so well. So now you have excluded two, which are correctly excluded, A and C, we are left with B and D. I agree with you, this is a swinging heart, and a swinging heart, brings a very important ECG sign, which is? Electrical. Electrical alternus, which is yes. different than pulse of alternus. Okay. And this is IVC, which is dilated but collapsible. So it's, it's not that much suggestive of tamponade. Now we come to B and C. What's the difference between B and C? Both are obtained at the LVOT. So we have LVOT. TVI signal by PW. What does it mean here and what does it mean here? You see here, what, what we have is what? Beat to beat variation. Beat to beat variation. Beat to beat variation of the velocity is what? What is this? This is what? Uh huh. And how's interventricular interdependence? Uh, no, no. Pulses yeah. alternus, this beat to yeah. beat variability. This one is pulses alternus. Pulses alternus, which is a clinical sign. You put your hand on the pulse, you'll find that one is weak, one is normal. 
or strong, weak and strong, weak and strong. So this is pulsus alternance. Pulsus alternance is a sign of severe LV systolic dysfunction. Okay, severe LV systolic dysfunction. So this is pulsus alternance. Now, what is this? This is the echo equivalent of pulsus paradoxus. Because what we are seeing here, follow me, this is inspiration. You see during inspiration, it goes low. Expiration, high. Inspiration, low. Expiration, high. So during inspiration, you get low velocity. During expiration, it's higher velocity. So this is exactly what we are seeing here. Okay, but here in terms of plot pressure, here in terms of uh, LVOTTVI velocity. Okay, so this is pulses altern, uh, sorry, pulses paradoxus by echo. So in, in a tamponade or in a patient of large precardial effusion and we are suspecting tamponade, we put the cursor in the LVOT and we get this tracing uh against a spirometer and we see if we demonstrate more than 10 percent variation between inspiration and expiration this is significant of tamponade okay good now this emote is most consistent with frequent topics elvad tamponade artifact, sinus arrest, or pose. And this is a mode of the aortic valve. You see here it's labeled aortic valve. So let's follow the aortic valve. Opens, opens, opens. We lost it here, we lost it here. It opens just a little bit here and back to normal here. So what is this? What does that mean? Any suggestion? Any idea? Might be frequent ectopics. Uh? Might be frequent ectopics. Yeah, so frequent ectopics, but you have the ECG above and it doesn't show any, you see? This is consistent with tamponade as there is RV, R, uh, Why you say tamponade? Because uh, this arrow, uh -huh. uh, during uh, uh, systole, there is a uh, there is a um, Mm. It's going in, uh, means there is uh, there is loss of opening of the aortic valve here, here and here, and it, it's, it's a little bit here and back to normal here. And the ECG is normal during this time. So your idea is tamponade, which is the right answer, but the question is why and how tamponade causes this. It is the same as pulses. What? Paradoxus. What paradoxus. is paradoxus? Pulses paradoxus is what? Is the decrease is the decrease in arterial pressure during, during inspiration. During an inspiration. Great. Yes. So we yes. said that this sign can be elicited by clinical, you know, you yes. the cuff and is fig manometer and you can see the pulses paradoxes. You can see it this way also, this way, this way, which is here by invasive hemodynamics. You see that the inspiration shows lower blood pressure than expiration. You can see it this way across the LV or TTVI when the velocity goes lower during inspiration and higher during expiration. Now we can sometime in extreme forms of tamponade, when the patient is in shock or approaching shock, it might lead to this nasty tracing of M mode, 
where the decrease of the cardiac output during inspiration is so low as to fail to open the aortic valve. So this is a phase of inspiration. You see this one, this part is inspiratory phase. So the flow across the LVOT was so low, was so low as to fail to open the aortic valve or it opens the aortic valve only a little bit. And now we come to expiration. Now the flow recovers. This is expiratory phase, inspiratory phase, expiratory phase. Okay. Good. You get it now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. A 70 year old gentleman who received radiotherapy for cancer and now admitted with heart failure. The tentative diagnosis is a combined restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis. Taban, we know that radiotherapy can affect the heart in different ways. Okay can lead to degeneration of the valve, can lead to constriction, can lead to constriction or the combination of both. Now, this patient has combination of both, restriction and constriction. Which of the following features suggest that the restrictive pathology is more dominant? Right. BMB level le less than 200, mildly dilated atria, pulmonary artery pressure of 45, septal, bounds, low global longitudinal strain, and lower septal strain. Now, so I'm, I think, uh, you think what? Septal bounce. A septal, a septal bounce is more suggestive of restrictive or constrictive? Constrictive. Huh? Constrictive. Exactly. So, like in the question is asking about which feature suggests restriction is dominant. So, septal bounce is out. Pulmonary artery pressure e. tends to be higher in restriction or constriction. Okay, so your answer is E. Great, that's the right answer. Okay, so let's go one by one. PMP tends to be higher in restriction or in constriction? Restriction. Exactly, in restriction. Because in restriction, it's a muscle disease and the muscle is stretched out. So the BMB tends to be higher because BMB is a stretch marker. But in pericarditis and constricted pericarditis, the heart is unstretchable because it is tightly constrained by a tough fibrotic precardium from outside, okay? Mildly dilated atria. The atria tends to be more dilated in restriction than constriction. The pulmonary artery systolic pressure tends to be higher in restriction than constriction. The septal bounds is a constriction feature, but the GLS, here, low GLS and lower septal strain, as I'm gonna show you, is more of restrictive than constrictive. Now, remind you that the, 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 we have parietal precardium and visceral precardium, and in between there is a potential space in which there is a fluid, physiological fluid, which is like 50 cc of serous uh, plasma ultrafiltrate fluid, okay? And this is the normal precardium. This is an inflamed precardium with fibrous strands. And this is a precardial effusion. And you see the rough uh, surface of the uh, parietal precardium and the visceral precardium, which is here. This is an inflammation. This is pericarditis, okay? Now, if you look here, we are seeing a heart in cross section. This is grassy specimen, and you see the heart is surrounded by what? By a calcified precardium. This is calcification all around the heart. And this is fibrosis all around the heart. So this is fibrotic precardium, and this is calcified precardium. So in, in constrictive precarditis, you get both fibrosis and calcification. So the precardium is fibrotic and calcified, okay? 
But remember, there are rare cases of constriction with normal thick pericardium. So if you were asked about can constriction take place with a normal pericardial thickness, the answer is yes. Okay. Now, the normal thickness of the pericardium is less than two millimeters. If it is more than four, that's a constricted pericarditis. And if it's more than six, this is very specific of constricted pericarditis. And remember, 18% of constricted pericarditis have normal thickness pericardium. Okay? Remember, these figures are really important. Two, four, and six. Two, less than two is normal. Four, suggest pericarditis. Six, is so specific of pericarditis, constricted pericarditis, I mean, and 18% of pericarditis may have normal thickness pericardium. Good? Okay. Now, what are we seeing here? What is this? Black spot on the surface of the heart. Could be melanoma? Yes, this is melanoma. And what is specific about melanoma on the heart? What is specific about melanoma and the heart? Melanoma has a very peculiar affinity to the heart. Yani, mets to the heart is exceptional, right? We don't see a lot of mets. Mets in the bone, in the liver, and things like that are much more common than mets on the surface of the heart. But for melanoma, no. Melanoma walks preferentially to the heart. Okay. And here, if you see here, there is a rough surface of the heart. This because of mets. These are mets. Okay. Mets. Now the mets seeds in which part of the heart? Now we have the precardium, we have the myocardium, we have the endocardium, right? Now, if we have mets, where does it usually go? Uh -huh. Pericardium. Pericardium. Exactly. It goes to the pericardium. Okay. So it goes to the pericardium, followed by the myocardium, and leads to the endocardium. So you might find a mets as intracavitary mass, but that's vanishingly rare. Mostly, they seed on the surface of the heart. Now, what is the most common cause of mets to the heart? Or what is the most common cancer that leads to the meds on the heart? طبعاً إذا قلت ميلانوما هنا حنكون غلطانين لأنه ميلانوما إذا إذا نحنا مسكنا كل البيشن اللي عندهم meds on the heart that depends on what is the most common type of malignancy أصلاً people are suffering which is CA breast and CA bronchus so statistically the vast majority of deaths in the heart is due to the most common type of malignancy, which are CA breast and CA bronchus. Back in melanoma, Aslan is a rare tumor. If we have melanoma, then the chance of having uh, a cardiac meds before any type of meds is the highest among all cancers. Okay? So you get the difference between affinity and the most common. Okay? They are different. Now we come to the precardial fusion. I want to, you to remember, because I, I told you that uh, last time, I think we have uh, promised to, to not exceed one hour, right? And I think, yeah. So I'm not going to exceed one hour in this. Now, just for the precardial fluid, because precardial fusion and tamponade it's very essential cardiac emergency, and we should be acquainted about all the aspects of cardiac tamponade, clinical, ECG, echo, and how we treat. That's really essential. Now, when the fluid accumulates, remember, it's not the tamponade is not all or none. It's not all or none. So it's not we go from here to tamponade. 
there is a progressive stepwise sort of hierarchical changes in the heart that takes place cumulatively. But unfortunately, there is a stage of unpredictability. Yani, as we have increasing precardial fluid, we have increase in RV filling, we increase in LV filling, and here is the cardiac output. So the cardiac output, though we have increasing RV filling and LV filling, the cardiac output remains steady and slightly drops until we come to a stage when it goes steeply low. This is the stage of cardiogenic shock. So you see, it's not so progressive and predictable. So we come to a stage when things just turn so nasty suddenly. Okay. Unfortunately, it's hard to predict when is the time of this particular patient to go for tamponade. That depends on so many factors, the fluid volume, the acuity, and the speed of fluid accumulation. And if I take you to the lower graph here, we have the limit of precardial stretches here. So the fluid can accumulate over a longer period or, or over a shorter period. So if we assume we have the same amount of fluid, let's say 500 cc of blood, that accumulates over two days versus the same amount of fluid, 500 cc of fluid that accumulates over two weeks. Which one is more likely to cause tamponade? Which one? Rapidly accumulating. Uh, rapidly accumulating, exactly. Rapidly. Yes, because you know, this precardial stretch, the limit of precardial stretch depends on time. The slower the accumulation, the more the precardium has the capacity to stretch and accommodate and absorb the pressure. But if it's accumulating rapidly, that's gonna overwhelm the precardial stretch and tamponade ensues, okay? So this is important. And the amount of fluid is important. The fluid status of the patient himself is important. And if the patient is dehydrated on dialysis, it's not like a patient of euvolumic status. So how and when the patient is gonna go for tamponade depends on so many factors. But overall, it's unpredictable. It's unpredictable. That's why when you are suspecting or you are having a patient of live precarious fusion or stuff like that, I think you have to be vigilant and keep an eye because he might suddenly deteriorate and go into, uh, goes into cardiac shock, okay? Now, precardial effusion, how are we going to analyze precardial effusion uh, in echo? We see the size, the distribution, the quality, etiology, and hemodynamic effect. How do we do that? We also have quantitative assessment of the effusion. So we know exactly how much of effusion do we have. Is it mild, moderate, or large? Then we look for the chamber collapse, the timing and duration. We look for E-velocity respiratory variation through the mitral and tricuspid valve. We look at the IVC. We look at the diastolic ventricular size variability with respiratory cycle. And then we can do other stuff. But these are, the underlying one, are essential for all patients and routine for all patients of precardial effusion. Now, is it precardial effusion or pleural effusion in echo? That's not always easy. But our landmark is the descending aorta. So in the parasternal long axis, the descending aorta is the black hole here. So if the fluid is here and crossing all the way above the black hole, this is pleural effusion. If it is, medial to this one and never crosses behind it, that is precardial effusion. So if you look here, this is precardial effusion and this is pleural effusion. Okay, good? Okay. 
now this one here is a bit tough because what is this fluid here? Is it precarial fluid or plural fluid? What is it? Uh huh. Anybody? Any guess? Uh, yeah, it is plural fluid. <laughs> Why? Yes. Lahiz innaha, it is just around the heart. Yani if I exclude this mass here, I am seeing a fluid around the heart. So I have a tendency to diagnose precarial effusion. Like in seeing the lung in the middle of the fluid makes it plural effusion. So this is another landmark. So the first landmark is this one, descending aorta. The descending aorta, lateral to it and medial to it. The other one, seeing the lung in the fluid. If you see the lung in the fluid, this is pre plural effusion, not precardial effusion. Okay? Good. Now, what is this? Sometimes you see a fluid that is like this. Hairy kind of fluid. Check the appearance of uh, the tuberculous pericarditis. Yeah. Check the appearance of uh, the tuberculous pericarditis. Yes. So this indicates, this, this is called fibrous strands or fibrous adhesion. Uh, it's due to inflammation, infection, malignancies, okay? High protein content and of the fluid. Sometime after traumatic pericardial synthesis and you introduce blood into the a uh, precardial space, you might find uh, precardial, a fibrous strand or stuff like that. Now, so this points to a particular set of etiologies, right? So this is more likely to be an exudate than transudate, more likely to be relating to inflammation, infection, and malignancy than innocent pericarditis, okay? And the other thing about this is Sometimes it makes tapping difficult. Why? Because septating. Yes, because it's septated. So if you go by your needle here and you pierce this part, the fluid is no longer free floating. So it's pocketed by the septa. So you might drain this pocket and you fail to drain this pocket because of the septation. So it makes tapping difficult, okay? It can also, yani this form is more likely to end up with constrictive pericarditis. This adhesion might remodel over time into fibrotic and thick and calcified pericardium. So that's why when you see fibrous pericardium, you know what does it mean? Okay, that is what does it mean? Now, Look at the heart here, and we are seeing something around it. And the same heart, or, and uh, some, some other view, and we are seeing something around it. What is this, and what is this? This one is fluid, and this one is fat. Fat, the epicardial fat we have spoken uh, about. This is precardial fat. So you have to know which is which. Is it fluid or fat? Okay. The fluid, as you see, is darker. Okay. Like the cavity here. And uniform. Here it is less dark. So it tends to be more of isoechoic. Isoechoic. This is hypoechoic. Walakin, that is not always true. Yani, al fluid, yes. Lakin, sometimes you can have hematoma, sah? Mishkira? Yani, post, post cardiac surgeries, you may have a hematoma. The hematoma will not look like this, but it will rather look like this, just like the fat. And here you have to be cautious. And here comes the focused analysis about is it a hematoma or fat? Okay. Now, what I'm showing you in these slides is that how you could tell apart the precardial from the plural effusion. 
Second, how you can tell apart the fluid from the fat. Okay, and I'm hopeful that you get the points here. Okay. Now, what is this? This is fat. You see the fat? Some might say it looks like fluid. No, it's not fluid. If you focus uh, thoroughly, you're going to find that it's not fluid. You see, this is fat. But it can be hematoma, by the way. Hematoma just looks like that. But hematoma, it needs a special scenario, right? So uh, how I find my way out of this problem is if I see a patient post-op, they refer him for echo, and we have the echo. And I see accumulation around the heart. That looks like hematoma or fat. I just scroll back in the previous studies, and I see and I compare. If it is fat, it would have existed in the previous study. But if it's a hematoma, it's going to show new. Okay? So that's how you can sometimes uh, distinguish between this and that. Now, the fluid, the precardial fluid can be mild or small, moderate or large. That depends on what. When are you going to say small, moderate and large? When? That depends on what? Mm -hmm. It depends on? Like here, I'm gonna show you. Just confirm that my sound is still clear. Is it still clear my sound? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to show you how we are going to measure the fluid. This is how you measure the fluid. First of all, focus with me here, how we measure the fluid of the precardial effusion. First, go for this image, for example, and select a diastolic frame, not systolic frame, diastolic frame. So the heart is relaxed. And then you drop a line perpendicular like this. Let's say it's 1.5 centimeter. That's it. This is how you measure it. From this view, you can measure it from any view, okay? But you have to select the diastolic frame, not systolic frame, diastolic frame. And if it is less than one centimeter, that's small. If it's one to two, this is moderate. Above two centimeters, this is large. Less than one, and more than two and in between. You get it? Okay, that's the sizing of the precardial fusion by dimension and analysis. Lacking, do you think this is always uh, accurate? It's not, Mashkida. It's not always accurate. Why? Because the fluid might not be circumferentially distributed. There might be fluid in some areas larger than in other areas. posterior because by gravity the patient is lying flat, so it tends to pull posteriorly. So you find the posterior pool larger than the anterior pool. So there is another way of doing it. We are starting to adopt this method, which is volumetric assessment of the fluid. So you see the fluid, you trace the fluid like this, and then you trace the heart outer border like this. And you use Simpson method, which is the method of disk, you get the volume by subtraction. So the subtraction of the outer volume and the inner volume is going to give you the volume of the fluid. They found out that the ecostimate of effusion volume by this method correlates so nicely with the actual volume drained in pericardial synthesis. Okay, so and I encourage you to use this one. So this is about the use of Simpson method, which we used routinely for LV systolic function assessment and ejection fraction. We use it here because it gives us volume, right? So when you trace here and you click on yeah, Simpson modified disk method, 
the outer and the inner and the subtraction of both. That's gonna give you the volume, okay? The volume of the fluid. You get it? So this is volumetric assessment of the fluid. What I have described here is the dimensional assessment of the fluid. Like in the routine one that is used and adopted by all, is this one, by the way. It's the dimensional, less than one, between one and two, and more than two. Okay. Now, what is this here? Look here. I am seeing a fluid here, fluid here, and a fluid down here, but there is something also here. What is this? What is this? Anybody? Any guess? You see the RV free wall is this one here. This is the border of the RV fluid wall. I am seeing a mass here and a fluid here. That's the fluid. So what is this piece of mass here? What is the differential diagnosis? Pericardial cyst. Uh, precardial cyst will be a fluidy-like oh, texture. Yes. It will be just like the precardial effusion. Yes. Hematoma? Huh? Hematoma? Hematoma, exactly. Yes, it can be hematoma, you know? Or it can be... Met. Okay? Or it can be... Mesothelioma. Uh, okay. Mm, tumor. Okay. Good. What else could it be? And by the way, the last poss possibility I'm looking for is likely the most valid one or the most relevant one. Epicardial fat. This is epicardial fat. We have... Uh, now discuss that we have epicardial fat. And when the epicardial fat, the epicardial fat is right here above the heart. When the fluid accumulates, it's going to stretch the parietal precardium away from the visceral precardium and the fat is going to pop up. So it's going to be swollen. It is swallowed a little bit and it appears more stout than it used to be. So this is epicardial fat. So it can be epicardial fat, which is the most likely diagnosis and innocent and you need to do nothing. But remember, bear in the back of your mind that it might be mess, it might be hematoma. Okay. Good. We have discussed this one before. This is a swinging heart and the corresponding ECG, which is electrical alternance like this. Okay. Now, what do we do in ECHO for the analysis of precardial fluid? We need 2D, which is here, 2D data, M mode data, and Doppler data. So it's an integrative analysis. So it's not enough at all. You put your probe and get two or three images and you are done. No, it's a comprehensive exam that includes 2D data, M mode data and Doppler data. Okay. And you analyze all these signals together, okay, to reach a harmonious diagnosis about the state of the hemodynamics. So probably you are not going to report in the echo that we have tamponade or not, but you are going to report if this fluid is hemodynamically effective or not. Okay. Now, this slide is paramount. I want you to focus on this one, okay? We have the diastolic collapse of RA, one sign of tamponade. Duration of RA collapse to cardiac cycle more than 0.34, yeah, more than one third of the cardiac cycle. Diastolic collapse of RV, pelithoric IVC. Now, if I ask you from among all these 
signs. Which one is the most specific of the imponent? The historic collapse of RP. The historic collapse of, of RA if it is more than one third of the cardiac cycle. The specificity is 100 and the positive predictive value is 100. So it rules in precardial uh, it rules in temporal. Now, what is the most sensitive of all these signs? The most sensitive is the pilithoric IVC. The negative predictive value of it is approaching 100%. If you look at the IVC and it is not pilithoric, you ruled out tamponade. Good. You've got to know that the science is في signs with different specificity and sensitivity and therefore different negative and positive predictive value. نحن what concerns us as clinician عايزين نعرف what sign can rule in tamponade accurately or with high degree of confidence and which one can rule it out. So now I want you by the end of this lecture to know that the pyrethoric IVC is the most negative predictive value is the rule out. If it is not pilithoric, that rules out tamponade. Now, if you look at the RA collapse and you time it to the cardiac cycle and it is more than one third, this is a ruling of, of tamponade. Okay? That's positive predictive value and negative predictive value. Okay? You get this? Yes. Yes. Now, this is the RA collapse. RA collapse. Now, how I am going to time it? طبعاً, the timing بتاعه حيكون صعب بالنسبة للناس. يعني, how you time the RA collapse? You do M mode. شوف تفتشوا على ال apical 4, like this. And you bring your cursor across the RA wall here. And that's the RA. Now, where is the collapse? Is it this one or this one? The collapse is when it moves towards the probe. So it's this one. Now I'm going to time the collapse duration here and I compare it to the RR interval. If it is more than one third, that is very specific of tempora. As easy as this one. Okay? Good? Lano is a inta talata fi al collapse kide yani by 2D. You might not know exactly how much it occupies of the cardiac cycle. Like in by the M mode, the end by the M mode, you have how long it occupies. Again, it's the RR interval. So you can have an estimation of how much it occupies of RR interval. Okay. So I encourage you to uh, use M mode for this particular side. Now, what is this here? This is what? You see the RV? What, what is happening to the RV here? What is happening to the RV? We have fluid, taban, which is here. That's the fluid. And here. So we have posterior and anterior. And look at the RV. What are you seeing? Look at diastole. During diastole, it gets collapsed. Collapse. So this is RV diastolic collapse. Again, it is one of the specific signs of tamponade. But you can get it by M mode even better. See it in M mode now. This is the RV free wall, and this is the RV diastolic collapse. How do I know this is the RV diastolic collapse? It's not the systolic collapse, which is normal. Look at the aorta. Here is the aorta. Aorta is open in systole and closes in diastole. So this is diastolic phase. That is diastolic phase. Or by the ECG. That's the QRS. And this is the diastolic period. And this one is during diastole. So this is diastolic collapse of the RV. Okay. Again, this is specific sign of tampon. Okay. Good. 
and this is the IVC. So the IVC, you we, we now know that the IVC is important uh, because it can rule out tamponade if it's not plethoric. How do we define plethora of the IVC? By being dilated and non-collapsible. Dilatation is usually more than 2.5 and non-collapsible, along with the dilatation of the hepatic venous system as well. So like here, it's pelithoric IVC. Sometimes it can be so pelithoric as to see dense spontaneous contrast. Dense spontaneous contrast like this, okay? So this is the pelithoric IVC, okay? Uh, now, we also have to look for respiratory variation across the mitral and tricuspid, and we, we, we time it to the, uh, to the respiratory cycle and see how much the difference. I'm not going to go deep in this, but these are one of the features of uh, tamponade. If there are changes exceeding 25 here and more than 45 on the tricuspid valve. So the difference between the velocities here, if you compare this one to this one, if it is more than 45, this is significant of tamponade. And in the mitral, if it's more than 25, this is significant of tamponade. Time. Okay. Now, يبقى لحد الآن عرفنا إنه نحن we are gonna look at the 2D to size out the precardial fluid, okay, and to look for the chamber compression, the RA compression, and we time it across. Uh, we time it against the respiratory cycle and see how much it occupies of the cardiac cycle. We look at the RV diastolic collapse. We look at the IVC and see how plethoric it is in terms of dimension and non-collapsibility. And then we look at the respiratory variation across the mitral and tricuspid valve. Now, who of you is doing echo and encounter a case of precardial effusion? Who of you so far? No one? Yes. Um, one time. Yes. Or, or two, two times. So you have done a case or cases and you have seen precardial effusion, right? Fine. My advice to you, when you go to the subcostal view, be cautious to assess the amount of fluid and to judge about the RV diastolic collapse. Lano subcostal gives you a false impression of a very large fluid and collapsible RV. Okay? عشان كده, the amount of fluid is better judged at the parasternal long axis or apical window. And the collapsibility is best judged at the, where the RV collapse is best judged where? Where? In here. Here. Parasternal long axis. And in mode. M mode, you put an M mode like this, and you see this one. This is how you assess for RV diastolic collapse. So don't assess for RV diastolic collapse from the subcostal window. And why is that? Because they have found that during inspiration, the diaphragm is pulled down, and the parietal, uh, uh, parietal precardium, because it's adherent to the diaphragm, moves down. So there will be a gush of fluid at this area. So you see here, the fluid was this, um, this much and it becomes this much be during inspiration because of the redistribution of fluid. And this is gonna give you an impression of a large effusion here and a, and a collapsible RV like this. But that's not true. This is just the redistribution due to the diaphragm being pulled down, the parietal being pulled down, the fluid is redistributed and stuff like that. Okay, so be cautious to assess the amount of fluid and the collapsibility from the uh, uh, subcostal window. Last, how do we do if we have a patient of tamponade? What do we usually do? Uh, 
لكن قبل ده يا اخواننا اسي على الحين الان انتم اذا مثلا البيشنت از ستيبل كلينيكلي تمام خليكم معي كده اذا هو كلينيكلي ستيبل بلاد بريشر هارت ريت لكن عملتوا ايكو لقيتوا لاي بريكاري فيوجن بليثوريك اي في سي ار في ديس تيليكولابس ريسبيريتوري فاريشن سيجنيفيكانت ار اي كولابس مور ذان 1 ثيرد اوف كارديك سايكل حتعملوا شنو؟ ويل يو درين اور ويت اور وات؟ يو درين 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 تمام يبقى انتم كلكم الان يو ار ادفوكيتنج ا برو اكتيف ابروتش برو اكتيف ابروتش معناتها يو درين بيفور ما نصل مرحله التامبونات اف وي درين لما نصل مرحله التامبونات ذيس از ا رياكتيف ابروتش سو وي هاف برو اكتيف اور رياكتيف ابروتش ناو طبعا ثيوريتيكلي سبيكينج اتس اولويز بيتر تو اكت اهيد اوف كاتاستروفس لانه لما البيشنت يدخل في التامبونات ذيس از كارديوجينيك شوك اند يو مايت نوت هاف ذا تايم تو سيت اب ذا ذا ستاف فور بري كارديو سينتيسيس اند ستاف لايك ذات سو اتس بيتر تو دو لكن مشكله في بعض الاحيان ايش؟ انه البيشنت بيكون عنده ريسك اوف انك انت يو ستيك نيدل في البري كارديو هاي بليدنج ريسك مالجنسي ها انفكشن اند سيبسيس So in this case, you might uh, tend to act reactively. You wait, keep an eye on this patient, and whenever he shows sign of uh, hemodynamic deterioration, you stick the needle. Okay. Lakin, and I encourage you to act proactively as much as you can, if the clinical scenario permits. Okay. This is much better. Now, how are we going to do the precardio synthesis and and in, in, in which setup? Are you going to do it in the ward or in the cath lab or in the echo lab or where? Where do you do it? Both echo and cath lab. Echo lab and cath lab. Okay. You talk about people, but again, if, if you are confronted with emergency, you might need to do it inside. Okay. لكن if uh, if the time allows it's better to be in the cath lab مش كده طيب are we going to do it floro guided or echo guided echo echo guided good طيب انا am hopeful انه uh, i will manage to get simulator to sudan to practice these procedures بالايكو جايدنس لانه الايكو جايدنس اوف بيريكارديو سينثيسيس هاز تيبس اند تريكس اتس نوت ستريت اتس نوت اباوت بوتينج ذا بروب سينج ذا فلويد سيتينج ذا نيدل اند دريننج نو ذير ار فيو تيبس اند تريكس يو هاف تو ماستر تو دو ات رايت اوكي لكن نحن نفهم انه اتس بيتر تو بي ايكو جايدنس The alternative is fluoroscopy guidance. Okay, fluoroscopy guidance. Zaman can be stamalu hatta ECG guidance. They go from the subcostal and they put an ECG lead fi needle. Whenever they they get PVC, ma'ana they touch the heart, they remove it a little bit and they drain. Okay, fa marat bi 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 sawo is. Lakin khalas al ECG guidance wajab. Al an imma fluoro guidance. Lakin the standard is echo guidance. An echo, it helps you manifold. It first tells you about where is the largest pool. Hal mujuda hina around the apex, around the lateral wall, in the uh, RV free wall. La anu, wherever the largest pool of fluid is, decide your approach. Are you gonna go apical or parasternal or subcostal? That depends on where is the largest pool of fluid. So this is one. Of the benefits of echo. Second, it directs your needle, so it shows you that you are holding the needle and the probe in each hand, and then you are advancing your needle and you are seeing the needle coming in the plane here. So you are seeing the needle coming here. Sometimes, if you are in doubt, if you have pierced the ventricle or you are staying here, you can inject saline 
and you see the saline is going to fill the precardial space and no bubbles are going to be seen in the cavity here. Okay, and then you drain and you confirm the drain. You confirm that you have a good amount of fluid. Okay. Okay, so you get this one. So by this, uh, we end our session tonight. <laughs>